Well, hello, it's Kirsten Liebelt. Come on in. It's so good to chat with you again. How are you doing? How are you doing? It's the middle of the week. How are you doing? Are you staying on track? Whatever that means for you. <laughs> it's always a really good question. Like assess yourself, you know, halfway through the week, right? So I wanted to talk about sweeteners tonight. We've got Easter coming up in like literally what? Now, if today's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, in four days, Easter is here. And my kryptonite has been, tell me if this is yours. First of all, you can always tell me if you're on the replay, tell me where you're coming in from. And um, if you find any of this information helpful, like, share, and follow, okay? Because I would love to be able to help people navigate their insulin resistance. I help women over 40, reverse their insulin resistance, turn it back, I should say. You don't want to like make claims, right? So turn it back so that you can finally lose weight because when your insulin and your sugars are high, you can't lose weight. So I want to talk about sweeteners. So four years, and tell me if this resonates with you, four years, my deal was the Cadbury mini eggs. Now, I don't know if that's anybody else, but literally they're like crack. It's what they are. I'm convinced that they have a little bit a little bit of something, something inside. I'm just kidding. But, you know, usually like years ago, now this was a long time ago, the Cadbury mini eggs would come out, you know, right before Easter, like, you know, maybe about a month, maybe, but it was a very special, you know, you could only get them at Easter time. All of the different Easter candy was, I always loved Easter candy way, way, way more than I ever liked um, Christmas candy or Halloween candy. It was always Easter candy for me because of the Cadbury mini eggs. So, um, but this year, what I noticed, and for some reason, traveling, in, you're traveling in Minnesota right now, Jody. where are you? That is so awesome. Man, you know, and funny that you're traveling right now since we finally got snow. <laughs> all winter we go without snow pretty much. And uh, we were running around all over today. And uh, thank God, like this is the the spring. Spring is coming like within a few days anyway. So all the snow is going to melt quickly. So wonderful. The roads are clear. We're good to go. Um, but this year I paid attention for some reason. I was in Costco in January and it was like the beginning of January. Um I'm not even kidding. And the big family bags were available to purchase of the Cadbury mini eggs. And I was like, oh, dear Lord, what are we doing? So, you know, between Halloween and Christmas, it's really called sugar season. It's not really, you know, oftentimes during the wintertime, we start in, if, if we just think about this for a second, what I want to do is I want to just give you some of recommendations of natural sweeteners that you could be making some of your desserts with this Sunday. So if you've never worked with any of the natural sweeteners, this is your chance to maybe get just a tiny bit of information and then you can do something different, even if it's something you bring for yourself to eat because then it keeps you away from something else or you have it in your fridge for the weekend because you just know that maybe this is a weekend where you want to eat a lot more sugar than usual. But you know, it's really not sickness season when we hit winter. It's really not depression season. It really is sugar season. And I believe that with all of my heart, we start in, in at Halloween, we go right through just sugar, 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 all the way through Christmas. And then we go into Valentine's season. And then we go into Easter season. It's like we literally take this huge chunk of time where we are celebrating and eating sugar. And then we add sugar to the sugar. Does this make sense to anybody? Am I the only one? Like this is so true where you just have candy available to you all the time. This isn't how it was ever meant to be. So anyway, I, I have a, a soft spot in my heart for anybody that's a sugar addict because that was me. Like, hi, my name is Kirsten Liebelt and I'm a recovering sugar addict. And that's where I was in my 40s, just naturally speaking. It was very, um, very evident that that was my, you know, my bent. And remember, I think it was on when we were talking on Monday and I was talking about how, you know, sitting in front of the in my mind's eye, sitting and standing in front of like a potluck in the basement of the church. Remember that story? And asking myself if I could have anything that I wanted, what would it be? And for me, and this is not true for everybody, but for me, it's the seven layer bar. 
Y'all know what a seven layer bar is. It's amazingness on top of amazingness. Yes, <laughs> Jody, that is so awesome. I love gathering all of my, my Minnesota people. Like it's really fun. I mean, I'm seriously, anyway, it's just fun. Life is really fun. But anyway, so I, you know, that was just for me and I needed to find how to trade out sweets. And so um, one of my favorite things is uh, Maria Emmerich's sugar-free chocolate pudding now. Like if I have that in, you know, in my refrigerator, that's really fun. Or the other day, maybe it was yesterday, I made custard in the oven and that's really fun, you know, and it's just sweetened with a natural sweetener. So let's get into the natural sweeteners and see what everybody needs or thinks about these. So a lot of people don't know anything about natural sweeteners and they, they think everything is lumped in together. Like aspartame and diet soda and your erythritol as a natural sweetener or stevia. There's, there's no differentiation because we don't, we, education is not like just given to us. We have to actually go out and find it. Right. Uh, most of the time we're not going to hear about anything unless we go and check it out ourselves and be our own advocate, which is like one of the most important things we could ever do. So, um, I do like Maria Emmerich's information and, um, I thought that this would be very helpful. So let's start out with, I am going to start with, um, let me start out with stevia. Most people have heard about stevia. So stevia is actually an herb. So it's an herbal sweetener and it's extracted from the leaves of the stevia rebaudiana plant. And stevia is considered non-caloric as it contains virtually no calories it is intensely sweet, much sweeter than sugar. Some people find it has a slight bitter aftertaste, especially in high concentrations, used as a sugar substitute in various products, including beverages, desserts, and baked goods. So stevia is kind of common. We now we have Truvia and etc. Be very careful because oftentimes if you're finding a powdered stevia, uh, sometimes they've got fillers in them. And the fillers can actually raise your blood sugar. So especially for anybody who's already type 2, you actually don't want to just grab anything. And if somebody says stevia in the raw, I don't remember if that's a good one or not. I don't buy it. So I don't know that one. But check your ingredients, okay? Become an ingredient checker. Because again, what do we talk about a lot? The fact that marketing is really, it's just all about money. And that's what's happening. So you got to make sure. The other point that Maria Emmerich makes when it comes to stevia is that she will buy liquid stevia glycerate. So you can write that down. Let me see if I can find how to spell that. I just so I can make it easy. G L Y C E R I T E. It is less bitter as an alternative and it can give more balance sweetness. And I'll talk about using a liquid form here in just a second. Cause I'm going to tell you what I use for what. Okay. So that's stevia. That's number one, numero uno. Number two, monk fruit. Have y'all heard about monk fruit? Has that been on anybody's radar? I would love to know. Oopsie. Um, monk fruit, actually, this is super interesting. So it's also known, well, I won't say that. Okay. It is an herbal sweetener. Again, <coughs> it's extracted from the monk fruit, which is native to southern China and northern Thailand. Did anybody know that? I think that's really cool information. Monk fruit extract is generally non-caloric as it contains negligible calories. It is extremely sweet, often described as having a clean, fruity taste without the bitter aftertaste, sometimes associated with other sweeteners. So monk fruit is actually a really good option. I have a lot of people tell me that they prefer monk fruit over other sweeteners because it doesn't have an aftertaste and it is sweeter. So put that, just kind of file that information here for a second. And what Maria Emmerich would say about monk fruit is, uh, sweetness is 300 times sweeter than sugar, similar to stevia, but unlike stevia, it doesn't have a bitter aftertaste. Again, be a detective and watch the ingredients because since it is 300 times, this is why they put bulk ingredients in them. Okay. This, I'll give you the why. Monk fruit is great. Great. No weird aftertaste. Tanya says, yep, for sure. And so, um, but so real maple syrup, 
If you're insulin resistant though, no maple syrup. If you're not insulin resistant, you go for it. But if you are insulin resistant and you're trying to stop your sugars from spiking so that you can stop your insulin from being high and storing extra fuel as fat, not maple syrup, even though I understand. Like, again, I always say God made us good things. We just messed it up. And now we have to like heal from what we've done. But anyway, so um, because it is 300 times sweeter, what they do is they will typically bulk up with another sweetener to watch out. So you have to watch out for those bulk ingredients. Okay. And um, oftentimes they will be blended, um, which is fine with like allulose, monk fruit, stevia, erythritol, they kind of can make up different like flavor profiles. And so you can be good with that. Yeah, not raw honey either. And I know it sounds contrary to like, because I do, I feel this question a lot, but didn't God make honey? Yeah. And he did a phenomenal job, right? But we were never meant to eat sugar on the level that we eat it. And basically insulin resistance is literally the overconsumption of carbohydrates. And it's not just sugar. Sugar is just one of them. So once you're insulin resistant, and especially if you're type two, there is no, it's just all about balance. That doesn't exist when you are trying to get a handle on your sugars because the detrimental effects are just too great. So for women, I'm convinced that women are sliding into their forties. They're insulin resistant. They don't know it. They don't know that insulin is a hormone and they don't know that that is a key to that needs to be unlocked when it comes to being able to lose weight. Because if you have high insulin and if you have high sugars, you can't lose weight. And nobody knows this. I shouldn't say nobody. Most people don't know this. I did not know any of this. I'm Italian. I was addicted to sugar, all the things. But now what I understand is that because we've spent so many years eating the standard American diet filled with nine to 11 grains servings of grain every single day. Like we just over consume all the time. We go and we get these tall sugar uh, coffees and then we eat the scones and the bagels and the subways and the, you name it. Like we could go on and on forever, right? Well, what happens is we become insulin resistant and where fatty liver, for instance, wasn't, it was only in alcoholics 50 years ago. Now it's in our children. So it's time now we have to wake up. We have to wake up and change things before our health is really affected terribly, et cetera. So that's why we have to back off even on these good things that God gave us. Hey, Cheryl, very good to see you. Um, we have to back off. We have to say no now because we, now we have to undo. So now that we're undoing, that's when we, we have to switch things. So basically we've talked about stevia and then we talked about monk fruit. And the second, the third one that I'm going to talk about is erythritol. So now erythritol is a sugar alcohol. Okay. So it's a different, it's not an herb and it's not a fruit. It's a sugar alcohol and it occurs naturally in some fruits and fermented foods. It's almost non-caloric. Um, it has a similar taste to sugar, but it can have a cooling effect. So tell me if you, if you know what I mean when I say cooling effect of erythritol, most people know what, what this is. If they, if you've eaten any keto treats, you already know. Um, it's commonly used as a sugar substitute in baking beverages and various other products. So you hate all the Starbucks crappy drinks. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. You are very wise indeed, I would say. Oh my gosh, you guys, seriously. Have you ever watched the, um, there's a documentary on Prime. I'm trying to think if that one was called Fed Up. I don't think so. Uh-uh. That sugar film, that sugar film. And it talks about like how many, like I'm close, I'm close, not perfect. 80 grams of carbs, like in a Jamba juice, like it's obnoxious what we are doing to our bodies. That's a really, really good movie, by the way. Um, what is xylitol? I will tell you. Let me pull that one up too. I will tell you. Yeah. Cause that's another one to consider, right? Um, so let's finish up your erythritol. So that is basically your erythritol. Um, and what does Maria Emmerich say about erythritol? Hold on. I like to just add in her stuff. Uh, do I even have that on here? I may not have that on here from her. 
but urethritol is very, very common. And so you'll find like at Costco, you can go and you can get a, a urethritol monk fruit blend. You'll see that a lot um, where you'll see a mixture of urethritol and stevia, urethritol and monk fruit, et cetera. But if you don't like the cooling effect on your tongue, um, then you might want to switch it up and go straight monk fruit, go straight. We'll talk about allulose here in a minute. Do something like that. Um, oh yeah. Urethritol. Uh, this she's just kind of talking about the sometimes the controversial thought process on urethritol. One thing that I do want to say is um, the typical manufacturing process involving using, okay, it's kind of a fermentation process. Urethritol is a sugar, alcohol, or polyol. It is found naturally in some fruits and fermented foods. That's the overall on urethritol. But I do want to point out for anybody who's listening and you and you say, but what about the study that just came out on urethritol maybe about four or five um, months ago? Um, they have about an 11 minute video that's very worth watching. It They are very... Um, they're very careful about the ingredients that they recommend. And um, hey, Anna, good to see you. Um, and urethritol, they want to talk about that study because actually there are benefits of urethritol. The study was super sh super shabby and just really, really bad information all the way around. And you can look up on YouTube. This is just a little side note. Analyzing the urethritol study by Maria Emmerich. So um, I want people to have that information. Anyway, okay, let's go back then. So you were asking about um, xylitol, which I did not have on my list for tonight, but let me see what she says about that because she does talk about it. So xylitol, it's naturally occurring low calorie sweetener found in fruits, vegetables, and certain hardwoods. Interesting. Our bodies can produce up to 15 grams of xylitol. And actually that's a point on the urethritol. Our bodies actually do turn things into urethritol inside of us. But anyway, um, it can produce up to 15 grams of xylitol per day from the foods that we consume. Xylitol produces a lower glycemic response than sucrose or glucose, so it has minimal side effects on your blood sugar and insulin. It is not as low as urethritol, but sadly, urethritol doesn't work recipes such as low-carb ca hard candies like, okay, and then she's got some that she makes, because it will not melt down properly. So xylitol is what she's saying. It crystallizes as it cools. Um, as opposed to like an allulose, which I'll do not next. Um, some people prefer the taste of xylitol as compared to urethritol. I wouldn't use it as a general sweetener as there are carbs and that they can add up. So just use it specialty recipes like candies. Xylitol can be toxic to dogs. Everybody needs to know that. So as far as the teeth, I think I've heard that, but I don't have, she didn't say anything about that on here, but I have heard that. And you can probably look that up. That would be very good information, right? So when it comes to the last one, allulose, who has heard of allulose? I know I talk about it a lot, but a lot of people may have never heard of allulose. Um, when I make Maria Emmerich bread, like last Friday, we did a live on here and we made her bread, whatever day it was. Anyway, and... I always use allulose or an allulose blend because the bread is an egg white bread. And if you don't, it won't brown the same as a regular loaf of bread. And so like if you use all urethritol, it's going to just stay white. But allulose, oopsie, allulose browns. Allulose also stays soft in like the freezer. So if you want a scoopable homemade ice cream, use allulose. That is such a great tip. And um, basically, this is what it says. It's a rare sugar. It, natu it occurs naturally in small quantities in foods like wheat, figs, raisins, but it can also be produced commercially from sources like corn. Um, allulose has, this is talking about calories per gram. It tastes very similar to sugar with no significant aftertaste, used as sugar substitutes in various food products, including baked goods, be beverages, and confectionery, confectionery items. And then hold on, this is what Maria Emmerich says. Allulose is new sweetener that is a rare sugar that does, doesn't get digested. You can't find it in Canada, Cheryl. 
That's a good question. I don't know. Let's see. I'm going to keep reading from Maria Emmerich and I'll see if she says anything, but I have not ever heard her say that there is. So you just can't order it off of Amazon or anything. Is that kind of what you're saying? Because that does happen where other countries can't order things. Oh, the Amazon Prime about uh, sugar. That sugar film. That sugar film. It's so good, you guys. I should rewatch it. And I and I don't know if it's actually on Prime, right? Like, I, that's where I watched it originally. But it's a documentary following food habits, like in Australia and then coming to the United States. And I mean, it's like, be prepared to probably give up your favorite sugar drink. <laughs> Yes, you can't find it on Amazon either. Isn't that a stinker, Cheryl? That does happen. So let me just see if she if she says anything on that. Make sure I'm not missing anything here. Maybe Vodacost.com. Vitacost. What is Vitacost? Is that is that a site that maybe are you saying that maybe she could get that in Canada? Maybe, maybe. That might be. Have you ever heard of Vitacost, Cheryl? I don't know if that's something that you guys order through. But this is what she says. Um, it, it does not get digested. Allulose doesn't. So it'll, uh, it only has 10 calories per serving, has zero impact on blood sugars. Zero. Allulose is actually a phenomenal sweetener. She says she'll check it out. Very good. Thank you very much. Sharing, sharing. So what are you saying, Tanya, about that? Are you thinking that allulose would be on there, like a sweetener? I'm not sure. Anyway, you respond. And with the delay, I'll read. Um, they even have a friend test his type 1 diabetic son, and there was zero change in blood sugar. This is really amazing, actually. Uh, about two-thirds of allulose goes out through the urine, the, the rest goes through the large bowel. It has many great properties as it cooks, just like sugar and tastes very much like sugar. It also keeps ice cream soft in the freezer, but it can cause some GI issues with too much. So you can get a little bloated if you eat too much of it. Uh, so make sure to use it moderately. We typically use it in uh, ice cream recipes or things like caramel where you want it to caramelize. Um, and allulose can, so for you, and I don't know, Cheryl, if you guys... Um, if you guys have ever tried the Splenda, or if you guys can get Splenda in Canada, but Splenda has what's called a baker's blend. And that blend has erythritol, allulose, and stevia in it. So you can use that where it has just a little bit of allulose in it or a portion. And that's enough for your bread. You don't have to have straight allulose to make your bread brown. So that's an option. But again, I don't know if you can get Splenda, but if you can look up the Baker's blend, look up the Baker's blend. Hey, Ruthie, good to see you. It's a site years ago that you've used. Okay, very good, very cool, very cool. And then what was it? I was going to quickly look up. Hold on. The allulose one. So I have them all. So let me wrap up with, or let me wrap up that little section there with just this. So you can be buying powdered sweeteners, and you can be buying liquid sweeteners. So like, let's say you're going to make something for Easter and um, you want to make like, I've been, I've been eyeing this coconut cream cake. There's a website called All Day I Dream About Food and it's a keto website. And so it has a, everything is sugar-free and grain-free, right? And so I've been thinking about it, thinking about it, whatever. But let's say you're going to make something like that. And if you don't think that whatever is sweet enough for you, like you make something with your erythritol or... Um, you know, allulose or whatever, have liquid stevia on hand or a liquid monk fruit, and you can always give a squirt into your recipe and boost the sweetness. So that can be really helpful. So I always have like a kind of always have like a sweetener party going on in my pantry, so to speak, like I have different things happening so that I can use allulose for my Maria Emmerich bread. If I'm making chocolate, homemade chocolate pudding, oftentimes I'm using the erythritol monk fruit blend just because that's what I want. I do kind of save my allulose for the bread as a, as a rule of thumb. Uh, erythritol monk fruit for the uh, chocolate pudding. And then like if I'm making um, 
any kind of a glaze. Like if I'm going to turn the Maria Emmerich bread into like a Danish and I want a glaze, that's when I'm going to go into like maybe a powdered version of something. Now, like Swerve is a erythritol product, but they have a powder, they have a confectioner sweetener. And that's very helpful because you could take just a little bit of confectioner sweetener with a little bit of unsweetened almond milk and use it as a glaze on something. And I'm telling you, it really is amazing. Uh, allulose, A-L-L, thanks for asking. A-L-L-U-L-O-S-E. Al, like all, you, los, L-O-S-E. Thanks for asking because I say it fast and I'm sure that my Minnesota accent messes that up. I'm going to actually look up on Amazon here as far as, let's see if that sugar film is on there. It's a documentary. It looks like you have to rent it right now. Yeah, you can rent it for $2.99. They made it in 2015. I'm trying to remember if I saw the movie. I don't think I did. There's along with that, they talk about the movie Super Size Me. And um, I don't think I ever watched it. But you can get both of those, apparently. You can purchase them. But anyway, so $2.99, you can rent it. Worth it, in my opinion. There's all there are other things that there are other documentaries that are out there that are super helpful. Thank you, Anna. Yep, A-L-L-U-L-O-S-E. Very, very good. Um yeah, because I'll tell you, when we start to understand what we've done, then we are able to go, okay, so this actually isn't about deprivation. This actually isn't about um, anything that's a fad or anything that's um, supersizes a great film. You will never touch another McDonald's French fry. <laughs> Good to know. Um, this isn't about... Uh, I don't know, like there's sometimes I feel like the confusion comes from the fact that we don't know why we're doing what we're doing. So when I talk about insulin resistance, um, I talk about how, so first of all, I'm not a doctor, right? Um, but my dad died of type two diabetes when he was 63 and I was really young. I was 30. So my, my kids were babies and they lost their grandpa. And basically what happened was, um, you know, he died with a lot of medication that he was taking for his diabetes, but he had done a lot of, did all the heart surgeries and the kidney dialysis, et cetera. Well, my insulin resistance started in my twenties. In fact, I just talked to a lady today, you guys, this just really, really, this is why I come on and I do the things that I do because it makes me so angry. So, and this is one person out of so many, and she reaches out to me today and she says, I've been told all my life that I have a thyroid issue. And so she's gone down a certain road, whatever. And even as much as like 15 years ago, she said, I started to lose my hair and um, I've been wearing wigs, et cetera, whatever. And she has dealt with some, some cancer. And she um, basically had said that she went to a functional doctor finally, um, as opposed to just a regular. And she finds out that it's not her thyroid. And they said, oh, you you're, you're insulin resistant. She's like, okay. <laughs> like that's a completely different diagnosis. Now I understand everything's connected and I get it, but I have a lot of thought thoughts about the thyroid as well, because the truth is, is that like even Gary Brecka talks about how the thyroid is only 20% responsible for what's going on. And actually the rest of it is like happening like in your liver and then what we do is we take meds to kill the thyroid when the thyroid wasn't to blame. And he just has this whole conversation about this whole thing. And so here we have this misinformation and literally for almost her entire life, this has been a conversation for her and um, very frustrating that she now is like, okay, I've got to wrap my brain around the fact that I'm insulin resistant. So I view everything through the lens of insulin resistance, everything. And um, for those who, because it's a very narrow conversation. If you're eating something, is it spiking your sugars? Not, 
oh, we just have to have balance. And, you know, we have to have all of the marketing and everything that we've been told. No. Is it spiking your sugars? Because if it's spiking your sugars, then what's happening is you are, um, you're raising your insulin. And if you're raising your insulin and you're insulin resistant, then your cell is saying no. So all of the insul insulin is just floating around. And basically you're, I mean, this is a very layman thought process, right? But high inflammation, but then it's taking all of the glucose that was supposed to be stored as energy in your cell to give you energy. And it stores it as fat because insulin is a fat storing hormone. So you're left with a weight issue and you're exhausted because your cell is not getting energy. So there's this whole process of a hamster wheel, but it's all reversible. And isn't it just cuckoo bananas that we can be going to the medical establishment and not being given a fasting insulin test? How is this happening? I How is this happening? So once I began to research and understand, because I when I started to deal with my insulin resistance in my 40s, I didn't start with food because I didn't think I could. I'm Italian. So I started with targeted supplements. I talk about that all the time. That's the trio, the three supplements that have the three ingredients that help with insulin sensitivity. And Instagram, you guys are always the luckier ones. At the top of the Instagram page, there's a highlight bubble with testimonies on that. But anyway, but once I understood that if your insulin and or your sugars are high, you can't lose weight, it's like, well, then there is no other conversation. If I know I'm insulin resistant and I can't lose weight because my insulin and or my sugars are high, it ends the conversation. Now, I don't need to have a conversation about points. I don't need to have a conversation about uh, a prepackaged food program that has maybe whatever their balance is of protein, carbs, and fats, because now I know what I need to do. So over time, I went from basically kind of like a paleo thought process, realizing that wasn't quite good enough for me and my body, because when you're insulin resistant, life is different. Um, and I ended up keto. And now I would say I'm a very whole food keto. I eat pretty much whole foods all the time. Um, not necessarily a lot of variety all the time. I can be very, very boring, but that's just because I've got stuff to do. <laughs> so I stay kind of boring, but, um, basically whole food keto. And that's what I talk about in the Facebook group a lot. You guys, you can always go to my website, kirstenliebelt.com, my first last name.com. There's a Facebook blue button there. And every month I do a five day challenge. It's totally free. It's just right in the group. And it's the next one starts at the beginning of April so that we can talk about ingredient trade outs and we can talk about targeted supplementation. We can talk about a recipe and start to teach people, show people what it looks like to trade out your pantry a little bit. Like my pantry looks different than everybody else's except for Anna <laughs> and Ruth, because I know Anna, she's completely changed out her, her pantry. But you know, once you start to learn a new language, I'm telling you, it's amazing. And I think, and I, like I said to this lady now today, I said, you know, it's, it's hard to overcome the mental mind games that have been given to us by the industries that tell us we should be eating green all day long. But now that I'm completely, yeah, we're pantry twins, Anna says. Yes, we are. But because I um, I eat completely grain-free, completely sugar-free, I don't ache. And so you can have the exact same results. And it is it is hard so at the beginning because there are so many, it's like kind of like a, boom, 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 like a ping pong inside of your brain but this is healthy. I'm supposed to eat this. This is supposed to be this. And this is because we have all of these sentences inside of our brain. You know, this is heart healthy and this is supposed to be good for my gut. And this is supposed to, and they're just telling you crud is what they're doing. They're just telling you crud all day long. And so it's very confusing. And then if you add in like the today show and good morning America and what, and then this study and this study and blah, 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 and chaos ensues. And it keeps us from actually just taking steps. So now taking all of this information as far as sweeteners go, and you start thinking about Easter, like it's Wednesday, you've got time. You have time to make a decision for yourself, the dessert that you want to make that even if you're the only one that's going to eat it, who cares? You don't have to pay any attention to any food bullies. You get to choose your own health. But because I don't eat sugar, I, my energy is not going to crash. 
I'm going to feel amazing. I'll probably be the only one not napping on the couch. Maybe. I mean, it's not like I never want to nap, but I'm just saying. Um, and then like I was doing a reel, was it yesterday? And talking about, what was the impetus of that? Oh, just talking about how if you have unstable blood sugars during the day, it's why you're not sleeping. But if you don't sleep very well, it's raising your insulin resistance the next day, like cycle, hamster wheel, cycle, hamster wheel, and you have to get off the hamster wheel. So finding a sweetener and finding a recipe and making a recipe and adding it to your repertoire is a step. And then you should be really proud of yourself for taking a step. Be proud so that you can be like, you know what? Nobody else has to follow me. Nobody has to do this with me. I don't require anything of anybody else, but I am going to try. And then guess what? People start to eat the things you make, like my husband, and he's like, um, hello. You know, when are you making that pudding again? Well, that pudding just happens to be really high in protein. It's chocolate. It tastes amazing. And by the way, the liquid stevia that I was talking about that you can squirt into a recipe and up the sweetness level, there's a caramel liquid stevia. So I add that sometimes to the chocolate pudding. So then you have chocolate caramel pudding. And if that's on my, um, there's a like a two minute reel on my website, kirstenleebelt.com. Go watch that. Make the pudding. It's made with egg whites, a pint of cooked egg whites. What? High protein, no sugar, tastes amazing, fills up your tummy. Remember, protein helps you to lose weight better, helps you to maintain your muscle mass, helps to stabilize your blood sugars, like all the good things. You're making pudding tomorrow, Anna? Oh, man. I just have got to learn how to make pudding. Like, I need to quadruple the batch. But basically, you end up, like, whipping it up in your, in your blender. I mean, it's super easy. Super duper easy. So anyway, so I just wanted to come on and encourage uh, people. Oh, you found a powder on Vitacost. Okay, for allulose. Oh, very good. Very good, Tanya. That's awesome. Very good. Um, I just wanted to encourage you guys because you know what? Easter was always my favorite candy sugar holiday. And I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not. Every time I just share anything about whatever, somebody always comes to me and says, that's me too. And it's just okay for us to go, you know what? I want something different this summer. I want to get, I want to take control of my sugars and my insulin so that I can lose weight. That's me, right? And if you read any of the testimonies of the trio, that's what it's literally, it's just testimony after testimony. I usually give testimonies on Fridays, but it's just testimony after testimony of somebody saying, um, I couldn't lose one pound for an entire three years. And I started taking the trio in September, type two diabetic. Sugars went from the 180s down to the 150s over two and a half months. And then she loses 14 pounds. Like it's almost like it just helps your body to function from the inside out. Completely different. You know, somebody else that was on Ozempic and lost 10 pounds, couldn't get it in the pharmacy, gained the 10 pounds back, came back into the pharmacy didn't do the same thing for whatever reason. And um, then she started the trio in, oopsie, in December. And within two weeks, lost seven pounds. And now I think she's lost 20. Um, somebody else that just emailed me, texted me, I think it's in the, I don't remember what week it was. And she's lost like 23 pounds since the beginning of January. Like, I'm just telling you, what if that's the key? What if insulin, the hormone insulin, the fat storing hormone insulin is a key and we don't even know it because nobody's telling us this. It's just a thought process to pass out to people. So if you ever need information on anything, if you have questions, just um, message me. My DMs are always open. And this is kind of what I do is I chat with people behind the scenes to help people figure out what they do need and what they don't need for sure, right? because that's important too. So I would love to hear about anything that you guys do end up making for Easter. I will post online. I'll make my promise right now. I'm going to make something. I'll post online what I made um, and uh, share with you what I ended up deciding on. And you guys should also, I love it when people text me their pictures of things they're making or um, they DM me on Instagram or in my messenger and they tell me the foods that they're making because you know what? 
You have got to be proud of yourself every time you take a step. Don't worry about anybody else around you. Don't worry about what everybody else brought to the dinner table. Don't worry about what everybody else is saying because it's not, it's, it's going to be no different than what I grew up with, which was you have to eat, 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 manja, 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 and then you gain weight. And then they say, oh, you better lose weight. And then when you lose weight, they tell you not to get too skinny. Like this was my entire life. So you're going to probably come up with some of those people too on Sunday. If you know, assuming that you're a Christian and you celebrate Easter, right? Because that's just what we do, right? So there's a lot of food pushers on the holidays. Oh, come on, just a piece. Oh, come on, it was the best I ever made. Just take a bite, just take a bite. Come on, just take a bite. Really frustrating. And it's very manipulative. I'm just saying. So I have zero tolerance for that now, but it took me a really long time to get there. Because I'm like, no, no. I choose my health. I choose my lack of aching. I choose the fact that I can get on the floor with my grandbabies. I choose for me now. I choose for me. I didn't do it until I was in my 50s. But then I did go from a 2X down to a large. Post-cycle stopping. Which is very helpful <laughs> to be able to do that. Because my insulin and my sugars were in check. So... If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a super blessed night, you guys. And I think I'll be on on Friday with testimonies. And if not, um, it'll just be because I chose not to for Good Friday. So I haven't decided yet. I'm kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know yet. But you never know. Last Saturday morning, I came on and we talked about food. So you never know what I'm going to do. All right. Have a really good night and see you guys later. I have a touch screen computer, so it's funny because I tried to touch it and it doesn't touch it. There it goes. Have a good night.